Burry, sorry. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm David Grossman, director of Civic House, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our second annual um, Alvin Dubman Public Scholar Lecture. Dave Stovall, who will be introduced to in a moment. Um, as many of you know, for over 15 years, Civic House has been an active club for civic engagement and social advocacy for Penn students seeking to learn and work with community partners and with university staff and faculty toward addressing pressing social problems. From the arts to poverty, from education to political engagement, generations of students have found through Civic House's doors a gateway to relationships, conversations, and actions through which they have better understood themselves and, I hope, the world around them. Over the last 15 months or so, we've been actively engaged in a conversation among all of our constituents about how we can deepen the power and impact of our work using civic engagement coupled with education as a means for envisioning and working to realize social justice. And so the title of this evening's talk, and that of the accompanying picture justice gallery, which I hope you were able to see before you came in, held just outside these doors were no accident. They are energetic expressions of how we see our work manifest through asking questions, through asking how the world would look if we were to genuinely love one another, if we were to see one another as equals. We know that we must pursue justice through employing our heads, hearts, and hands as a community. Civic House seeks to do just that. Before passing on the podium to our students who will introduce the lecture and our speaker this evening, I did want to take a moment to thank the entire Civic House staff for making this event possible, and particularly Megan Foreman, who's taken what was already a great event and brought in the <laughs> So now I'd like to welcome to the podium Lauren Archambeau and Claire Penoffman, who will introduce our speaker and the lecture. Hi everyone. Um, welcome to the Gutman Lecture. This lecture series is named in memory of and in honor of the late Alvin Gutman. Mr. Gutman, raised here in West Philadelphia, lived with devotion to two of life's greatest purposes, family and Civic House would like to extend a warm welcome and sincere appreciation to the Gutman family, particularly those who are here with us tonight. Mr. Gutman's wife, Mary Burt, his daughter, Jane, his son, Jim, and his grandsons, Jane and Peter. Thank you for remembering him in this way and for your generous support that makes this lecture possible. Mr. Gutman's second greatest devotion was to community, and specifically to education. Among other roles, he served on the board of the Philadelphia Free Library, and was also recognized by Operation Understanding, a local organization that focuses on bridging cultural divides between African American, African American and Jewish youth to create compassionate and effective community leaders. For these reasons, it's particularly fitting that tonight's guest lecturer, Dr. David Stovall, is an educator and community leader who works to empower youth and promote the urgency of social change. It is my privilege to introduce to you tonight's guest lecturer, Dr. David Stovall. Dr. Stovall is a professor of educational policy studies and African American studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His research centers around critical race theory, social justice education, and the relationships between community stakeholders and schools. Consistent with his attempt to bring theory to action, he has spent the last 10 years working with community organizations and schools to develop curricula that address issues of social justice. His work has led him to become a member of the Greater Lawndale Little Village Social Justice High School uh, design team. In addition to his duties and responsibilities as a professor at UIC, he also serves as a volunteer social studies teacher. Furthering his engagement with communities, students, and teachers, Dr. Stovall is involved with youth-centered community organizations in Chicago, New York, and the Bay Area. In one exemplary project, he works with the People's Education in Chicago a collection of classroom teachers, community members, students, and university professors who engage in collaborative community projects centered in creating relevant classroom-based pedagogical strategies and curriculum. Please join me in welcoming David Stowell. Uninvited more than I am being invited. <laughs> right? 
So anytime somebody calls or contacts me by way of email and they say they want you to come, the first response is always, for real? <laughs> right? So thanks to Megan and the City House crew for following through. Right? So I'm also going to talk to you tonight like I will never be invited to this place again. <laughs> right? For the myriad of reasons. And you all will see why. Right? But one of the things that, so if don't blame Megan the Civic House for a mistake, they didn't know either. Right? But the thing that we actually, when we talked about the government lecture, one of the things that we wanted to put forward is why we actually are engaged in this moment. What is this moment about? Right? How is this moment part of a larger history that we need to connect ourselves to? So now, if I am a student of what James Ball will refer to as a radical imaginary, one of the things that I have to pay attention to is how we get to this moment, right? I want to be clear about where we are. I don't want to be clear about this moment in relationship to how people are challenging the things that are happening. Now, I'm from Chicago, right? I always love coming to Philly because Philly feels like the like shot me. Right? Every time I come, every time I, as soon as I get off a plane and I drive into University City or Center City, West Philly, North and the South, I'm always like, man, it's just like home. <laughs> right? And I look around and y'all got the same type of restaurants, y'all got, oh, uh, y'all got a thriving Puerto Rican community. Right? Y'all got, um, y'all have a uh, historical black community. So this thing, uh, every time I see it, I'm always looking at that space and saying, yeah, there's these parallels here. But in a radical imaginary, I also have to talk about some parallels that are uncomfortable. Right? Just like what you all are experiencing here in Philly, we experience in Chicago. And it's called hyper-segregation. Right? So Philly just isn't a segregated city. It's a hyper-segregated city. It's a hyper-segregated city that's experiencing extreme levels of displacement and gentrification. Right? Parts of the University of Pennsylvania were plopped on people's neighborhoods that displaced them. Right? So right across the street is the hospital. That hospital has a number of different iterations here in Philadelphia. Right? And when you think about walking on this, is that the, am I saying it right? Is that the Logan Walk? Okay. Okay. Locust. All right, now we want to get that right. So I'm walking here on Locust. And I stopped by, and we were, everybody was chatting, and I see something to the left. And I'd never seen it before, and I always heard something about it. The Wharton Business School. <laughs> right? The first time I was like, oh, that's Wharton. Oh, right? I almost did, I almost took a picture. Right? <laughs> because what comes out of the world? And this becomes critically important. So many, many of folks haven't heard of what we call the Boston Consulting Group. Mm -hmm. All right, so you all say, oh, we know that. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking crazy. All right? So the Boston Consulting Group, right, they actually formulate here at what? Many of our business conversations have now shifted to education. Education has been referred to as a recession-resistant industry. What does a recession-resistant industry mean? Well, one of the things that it means is that you can make projections that over the next 20 years, education will account for almost $20 trillion internationally in terms of the formation of schools. Right? And folks like the Boston Consulting Group look at Philadelphia and say, well, the thing that needs to happen here is we need to close schools. So in the last five years, you have closed almost 50 schools. Now, I talked earlier today about one particular school that really kind of blew my mind. And when we talk about this particular relationship, we can't have these discussions outside of the concept of white supremacy. Now, when I say white supremacy, I'm not talking about a bunch of disaffected white dudes who love Trump and their burning crosses. Right? It's very different. What we're talking about is the views and values of heterosexual, Christian, Western European, white descended males as normal, right, and good. These dudes. 
dudes are. Right? You can find them. Right? Whatever you find dudes are, you probably can find some really funky. Right? Because they think you don't get your you don't get memorialized in particular places unless you did something crazy first. Right? So now we got to actually we got another homework assignment. Like five of these five dudes are. Right? But in that process, when the Boston Consulting Group actually made that decision to close schools, one of the things that they said was they used the language of underutilization. Okay. Right? Now, the language is important because now the language shapes the action. And when the language shapes the action, the question that we always need to ask in the radical imaginary is who is the effect? And then when we talk about justice, there's a thing that I'm worried about, and this thing has been happening over the last, I would say, 20 years. Everybody got a social justice project, right? We do, we, you know, you come to us, but we do social justice, and then you say, what do you do? Well, you know, social justice. <laughs> right? And I'm saying, well, that's not it. There's something that's happening to folks. And this thing that is happening is having detrimental effect. But I don't want us to dismiss this, to dismiss this from the larger annals of history. Right? So there is a philosopher and historian by the name of Sophia Hartman who wrote a book called Scenes of Subjection. And I always want to shout her out because she says something that I think we need to understand in a very particular way. She calls the current moment the afterlife of slavery. Right? So if you think about something and its afterlife, what is it constantly reminding you of? And what is the first rule of slavery? And I want to prove this in relationship to schools. The first rule of slavery is to remind the enslaved that they are enslaved. So what does it look like in a school day? And when we talk about justice, what is the blatant, explicit, and intentional interruption of the afterlife of slavery? So if a young person comes into school and they walk through a metal detector, and they're in that same school, and they're given the merits if they're not walking on a line. And they go into the lunchroom, and they have a silent lunch. That is no longer a school. It is a jail. Now, many times we have a conversation about school to prison pipeline. I want to kick that up a little bit. What if we thought about a school to prison nexus? What if we thought about a school and a prison as the same place? Not a place that's reminding you of where you're going to, but a reminder of where you are. So now, I look here at Philly and I'm concerned about how cities can engineer conflict between particular groups. Now, here's the asinine process. You all close Germantown High School. You send all the young folks from Germantown to the rival school. Now, if anybody knows anything about young folks, if I split this room in half, and you want school and you want a rival, I send you here on the first day. What happens? We all figure that out. Fights. But a school district decides to do that 46 times in two summers. On whose back? And on what rationale? And then is the expected outcome part of what could be considered or should be considered that afterlife of state. Right? Because we often forget about the 13th Amendment. Some of us in history class, some of us might be in law school, and we kind of skirt this thing. The 13th Amendment says slavery has ended except when? Right? And they say for involuntary servitude as punishment. Where are you sentenced to involuntary servitude as punishment? Remember, y'all, I'm from Chicago. If I am sentenced in Cook County, the docket, the court docket will still say that David Stovall was sentenced to X amount of years and months of involuntary servitude. That is still the legal document. So now, when you're closing 26 schools in one failed summer, you're firing all the nurses, and then you fire all the counselors, what is the expectation of that place? And again, I only ask these questions because the radical imaginary is pushing, right? It's challenging me to think about this moment and what's
them, detain them for longer periods of time. It's not so much that this is just a bad situation, but it should also be considered an engineered conflict. So in a hyper-segregated city, where folks don't have knowledge of each other, once they get into the same space, there's conflict because they don't have knowledge of each other. Not because they are inherently prone to certain activities. And I think that becomes critically important. You all got a place here called Duckworth Center. Right? It talks about grit. Right? And I'm always think, thinking about this thing grit because are we talking about grit or are we subjecting another pathology towards black and brown bodies? Right? Now again, I'm, I'm prepared to be unbiased. <laughs> But at the same time, we have to be clear about this. And this radical imaginary is pushing us, right? So when we start to think about the world as how it is, then there's certain things that we're going to have to do. So the justice condition is telling us we cannot stop with recognizing how tragic these things are. But instead, what is the work moving forward? And that work is often painful. It upsets us. It gets us in spaces that we are often unprepared to engage. But that's not a bad thing. It is something that we should embrace. And because we embrace it, now the questions become different. As a 43-year-old, I am extremely appreciative of the young folks around the country who have told the world that their lives are of value. Right? So I have to shout out Patrice Cullors, Open to Meet Thee, and Alicia Garza for saying that their lives are critical to the understanding of the world. And something else they said that they're never given credit for, which is an extension of 50 years ago in a group called the Black Panther Party. They said that the liberation of black people is the liberation of the world. Right? So now when people hear that, they go, What's going on? Right? Well, this is what they said. The Black Panther Party 50 years ago said they stand in solidarity with all oppressed people of the world. Alicia Garza, Old Tumiti, and Patrice Cullors said they understand that the liberation of black people is deeply connected to the liberation of all oppressed people throughout the world. Earlier this afternoon, I talked about something that was mind-blowing, but exciting to see. So two years ago in Ferguson, Missouri, we all, are, we all saw what happened or heard about what happened to Michael Brown. Interestingly enough, when the protests ensued, there were a group of young folks from Palestine who sent some Facebook posts to the folks in Ferguson. And they said something that resonates with me. They said, if you are tear gassed, this is what you should do. If you are contained in particular ways, here's how you should respond. Remember, your cause is just right and good. And even more importantly, they told them, love it. And this is the thing that we often forget because now we see folks in the street, we see folks mad, y'all are probably hella juiced to see what happened in Chicago on Friday when we shut Trump down and tried to hit him in the mouth. Right? Folks were looking, folks, folks were, were emailing me across the country, man, are you there? What's happening? Like, did somebody, did somebody watch the stage? And the artist said, was he didn't come. Right? But the thing was, and this is that moment, how dare you come to a school that's 30% Latino and in between 15 to 20% Muslim? You act tough? <laughs> but who made that determination? Young folks. And when we talk about the justice condition, there are two groups of people who are rarely given credit for their participation in it. Young people and women. So when we talk about the justice condition, I understand that space is primarily occupied by young folks and women. And when we start to think about the justice condition differently, now, what have folks started to do to call us to remember what this call for justice really is about? Right? Because even 50 
50 years ago, there were folks who questioned King around this patriarchal leadership. We need to give all honor, honor and praise to a woman by the name of Ella Baker, whose names are never mentioned. Right? We need to think about her. We need to think about folks like Claudette Colvin. Now, if you really want to do your homework, think about Claudette Colvin. Right? So for people who don't know who Claudette Colvin is, she was the first person to get arrested for not giving up her seat in the Montgomery bus struggle. Right? She didn't give up her seat, but because of the imagery of having a pregnant young person being the person, the person to symbolize the movement, they elected to actually have Rosa Parks stage the protest. And when we don't know that history, we now start to perpetuate this thing in schoolhouses. Let me ask a general question. How many of you all in your K-12 experience felt like you were, being lied, you were lied to or something? Because it's 
all of us. So now, this group of young folks, they organize and they come to Anita Alvarez rallies and say, Anita must go, they got songs about it. But at the Trump rally, or interruption, <laughs> I saw a group, I got a picture of a group of about 12 young people. And they were holding this banner. And the banner just said, Bye, Anita. Now, I was like, man, right? The folks were unfamiliar with that comment. You have to see a movie called Straight Out of Comedy. It's, uh, it's about a, a young woman that in the movie's called Felicia, right? So this is a scene where they say, Bye, Felicia. And these young folks, seven, eight graders, they line up and they have this. The only thing that they say on the side is, Bye, Anita. And I'm saying to myself, man, not only the creativity and genius in that, but also these are 12 and 13 year olds who have now decided to educate themselves in a very different way, right? Who have connected themselves, who actually changed some voting legislation in Illinois. So now they're going to vote in Illinois whether or not, well, actually gonna, it's going to come up this summer. That you, if you're 17 years old in the state of Illinois, they're trying to pass legislation that if you're you turn 18 in the voting year, you can vote. Right? That all comes from young folks. That's all from their spaces. And now, when we talk about this moment, I think it's important to contextualize some of the stuff that you all are seeing here in Philly. But I want to put this in context of where I'm coming from in Illinois. We're beyond broke in Illinois. This is what I mean by this. The state of Illinois has not paid pension debt in 40 years. Illinois is anywhere from 15 to 40 billion dollars in debt. It has also not paid six to eight million dollars of bills for fiscal year 15. And even deeper, the state of Illinois, since June of 2015, has not had a budget. So as a state, we are going on a 10th month without a budget. So what's happening in that, in that time period? Drug treatment centers that are funded by the state have closed. Preschools that receive funding from the state have not been able to pay their bills. We're seeing teachers being laid off. There is a college in the middle of the South Side called Chicago State that will close its doors. My father is a graduate of Chicago State, 1963. Now, Chicago State is not allowed to accept freshmen. 30% of their budget comes from state appropriation. They have discontinued, they, they cut off their spring break just to have enough money to get them to graduation. That school serves 5,000 students, 80% of whom are black, 10% Latino. The largest, the largest, those two groups comprise of second chance students, First generation students, non traditional students, and veterans. 85% of Chicago State's population are in those four groups. So when people talk about anti black racism, all you have to see is the shuttering of Chicago State. Also, in a hyper segregated city, again, that's shut down, that's closed 80% of its public housing stuff, right? has closed 150 schools since 2004. Right? And has 126 schools that do not have libraries. So I want you all to walk out tonight and be like, damn, it's football. We just kind of depressed right now. Right? We all go to yeah. But at the same time, to understand this is the moment. So think about it as a young person. If you're in this moment and you decide that the condition is intolerable, what will you now begin to do? Biden, right? You start to make claims around the need to have an elected school board. Because Chicago has never had a locally elected school board. You start to call for the end of mayoral control, where the mayor of the city is the final say so in any matters that have to do with public schools. You will call for participatory budgeting. Right? There's a guy named Basharo. Um, 
who was in the 48th ward, and he literally, twice a month, lays out the budget for his ward, and now the residents of the ward actually decide where the funds are true. Now, he gets that from the Zapatistas, who actually used to use an assembly government that actually transferred itself into places like Jackson, Mississippi, and the election of a young, of a freedom fighter by the name of Choque Lumumba. Right? And actually started to engage in a participatory government. So now when we start to think about this, what is our justice condition? And now, are we willing to challenge ourselves as to whether or not we're doing justice work, or are we there for the charity moment? What is beyond the photo op? What is beyond the real world that challenges you in real ways? Right? A friend of mine, a master teacher, right? He talks to me, he says his first year of teaching, he went home and cried every day. Every day. And he always says, he looks me in the face, he's like, every day. Right? And then he says something very interesting. He said, it had nothing to do with the young folks. But it had everything to do with their religion. So now, how do we understand those conditions? What is the work? And how willing are we to interrupt the trope of white supremacy, the afterlife of slavery, and claim a justice condition as determined by the people who have first experienced the injustice. Because that's very different. Because you can have a program that you drop in somebody's head. Right? And they get mad at young folks for not coming to the program. Have you ever asked a young person whether or not you thought the program was good? A lot of times we never ask young folks about the program because we're fearful of their answer that would give us a truthful one. Right? We don't want to engage young folks because young folks bullshit me at this minimum. They will tell you the truth real quick. And the younger they are, the quicker that truth is going to come out. <laughs> right? So if you want to know the truth, just ask a five-year-old. They will, they will give you that front line and say, this is what it is. No. Right? So if you think about kindergarten teachers, what happens when you got a group of 30 young folks saying no? Right? And your friend of mine said, after snowball, I want them to be saying no for all the right reasons. I want them to be saying no to refuse their dehumanization. I want them to be saying no to give relevant lessons and not this Columbus bullshit lie that we've given them. I want them to have a real conversation around who they are in the world and I want to remind them every day that they are loved, valued, and they will change this condition. How do we support that? What if we train teachers to do that on day one? What would our world look like? And with the place that we do it in even be called a school. Because there's a difference between school and education. Education is the informed decision. School is largely order and compliance. The question that we need to be asking is, can education happen in school? Because in many places it is not. And because it is not, it further puts folks in tragic situations. But the gift, I would argue, the hopeful moment is now this raising of public consciousness. When you've got seven, eighth graders who are able to tell you about the colonial project and how the city of Chicago is reflected on the colonial project, I had an eighth grader tell me about France and all. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? He was just like, yes, yes. And, and, and he put it in eighth grade terms. He was like, this is how they get you. Right? <laughs> he was like, this, this is how they get you. They get you to believe this one thing doing something else, right? And when they do something else, they knock out your mind. Say, that's what I understand colonization to be. <laughs> what? And I'm like, who is your, who is your teacher? Right? And he was like, that's right there. <laughs> right? And he was like, I say to you, he was like, I say before, Greg. Right? And this thing, he's like, look, I'm, I'm from these spaces. Right? So when y'all are Philly, and they got all that was walking where Drexel is, you all right up, pressed up, on, pressed up against Drexel. I see all the construction, and I see this 
because that's the first sign of justification. The first sign of justification. <laughs> that's not, so that's that is not the first sign of justification is not the Starbucks. Right? Let's just get that all out. Let's get that all out of mind. The first sign of justification is when you see that white jock. Right? <laughs> Super tricked out baby carriage, right? <laughs> they got the baby carriage situation happening. And then they really want to get big with it. They got the baby carriage with the dogs hooked up to it, and the whole little joint. And then they super extra with it. I saw one one dude, one he had the baby, and the other one kind of holding the stand like this. And the dog, was like, <laughs> right? But the thing is, I say that in jest, but I, the, the question becomes, who's coming? And under what terms? Right? You got you all got places, just like you got in Chicago where rents have quadrupled. Right? And the question becomes, who and how do you even mention the language becomes important? So for you all who are in early studies, this language becomes important, right? Because they talk about up-and-coming neighborhoods. They talk about emerging spaces. But actually, if you look at that from a different frame, those spaces are converging on. Those spaces are displacing people. Those spaces should be understood as extensions of the colonial project. Right? And as David Harvey talks about, this is the accumulation by dispossession. So when young folks are, don't have a school to go to, and it's hard for them to live in that space, now they have to move. Right? They're not going to the King of Prussia. Always like coming through. <laughs> that is hell of a to me. I'm like, that is a tragic man. I'm <laughs> waiting for a king of Russia. You, can, you cannot do that hard. Right? You cannot claim the king of Russia like you really on that life. But a different, that's a, yet a different story. But at the same time, we need to think about this. And now, understanding the world, that gives us a different lens for what should be considered justice. And remember, in many cases, justice should be determined by the folks who have experienced the injustice. First, that is the rule. You cannot come in on a helicopter or some red and white horse or your fixed gear by. <laughs> then you're going to save folks. Right? Or that you're here to help. I want to challenge that. Because in many times our help is temporary. What does it mean to stand in solidarity with folks? What does it mean to engage in a solidarity that's going to ask questions of ourselves and our commitment first? What does it mean to do this in ways that are unpopular? What does it mean that we understand that young folks across the country and the world are putting their lives in front of state apparatuses claiming their dignity and self-determination. And this is this moment. And when we can see this moment, now our questions become different. Right? So it's not all lives matter. It's the claim to black life because black bodies are criminalized before they are humanized. I am thought of as criminal before I am thought of as human. And I have a school system that reflects that. That states have put up, and you all in Pennsylvania do an interesting thing with this. You all spend a quarter of a million dollars per incarcerated young person. I thought we were bad in the world, spend 77000 And then the district that spends the most on young people spends about $25,000. So in the state of Pennsylvania, you are willing to spend 10 times more to incarcerate a young person than you are to educate them. The question becomes, what do those young folks look like who are in those spaces? Who are their bodies? Where do they come from? What are their names? Right? If we can't say that those are black and brown bodies, those are black and brown bodies who have been historically dispossessed, just like in Chicago, 
those people are now making a claim. And the establishment doesn't like it. And I would argue that's a good thing. Because when we don't, when we agree to this order and compliance, things get even tougher. And given where I'm coming to you all from in Illinois, I don't know if they can get tougher. And I think the raising of a public consciousness has now pushed people to think about the work in a way that we haven't seen in 50 years. And I'm deeply appreciative of that moment. But at the same time, I want to be clear about when this thing gets tough. Right? Because movements are actually operating ebbs and flows. So what happens in the air, in the low point, who's doing the work? Who's doing this work from a justice perspective? Who's doing this work in a way to ask difficult questions? I want to thank members of the transgender community over the last 12 months. They've changed my understanding of the social construction of gender. Right? And how it operates in the bodies of people everywhere. So now thinking about that work, moving it in a very different way. Now, what does it mean as an educator, knowing these things to be real, who do I actually work in solidarity with for the purpose of justice? But justice as determined by the people who have not only experienced the injustice, but now have determined also the victory condition. And in that victory condition, there will be some things that people are unprepared for. And what we're seeing across the country is that college students have picked up on this. Now, I hope when the history is written that they actually acknowledge that college students actually got that push from neighborhood folks. Right? Because the folks who are actually doing this work are actually doing it largely from non-school spaces. Right? So now, when you start to think about that, it's picked up in colleges and universities because they've paid attention to what folks have done in non-school spaces. So it's a very different education moment. One that I'm very proud of that's challenging us to think about education differently. And if you all are thinking about justice, I got a couple of challenges. One, most of education is about what we do not know, but that we're willing to find out. Right? So, over the last, this past year, I have uh, been te teaching a social studies class with one of my former undergraduate students at a place that I was on the design team for called Social Justice High School. And I was telling folks earlier today, think about it. I got seniors eight period. <laughs> All right? I want y'all to think about that. What were you doing your senior year during a period? Somebody told, especially, what I always think about this, what were you doing your senior year during that period when somebody told you that they liked you? Right? Then they sit real close to you. Right? So whatever you got happening in instruction, you got about three people in class. Right? You can see the love cloud <laughs> coming over their head. Right? And you just think about sunlight. Right? So the drudgery of school and then being in a, in a Sunday room, right? Everybody kind of turns towards the sun, right? Because what does the sun represent? The sun represents the end of eight years. <laughs> the sun represents freedom, right? No matter how temporary, right? They say, all we got to do is this. And, and they look at each other like it's a show. It's like, man, all we got to do is just make it, yo. Just make it, make it. The bell's about to ring, man. We can do it. We can do it. Come on, man. Believe it. Right? We didn't talk about anything about justice. Right? We didn't talk about anything about freedom. Right? So this thing around being in that class, and that's not on my students, but that's understanding the conditions. And if I understand those conditions, now I say, well, what are we really here for? So what does it mean on the first day to say, I am not concerned about school. I'm much more concerned about education. And education is what we've been dispossessed of. And what does it mean to be dispossessed of something? What does it mean to have something taken away from you intentionally? What does it mean to be locked out of something and threatened with death when you claim it? So in our challenge, 
You need to think about the world and the way things are. And those things often present very difficult challenges. But one that I'm committed to engage. And I hope we are. And I hope we don't engage in a space that becomes social justice light. Because we're quicker to do that and claim the name than to actually do work that's going to question our humanity and question why we do this. And I think that's where we need to start. So let me check in with you all. Does that make sense? Right. Well, thank y'all so much for having me and we'll just engage in some questions over this last little bit. Thank y'all again. Students first get a little bit of knowledge, the first response is to be hella mad. Right? Like one of my 
my shoes, a couple years back, and said, so what about go out and just go get one? Right, who? <laughs> Which one? Right, and where are you going to go? Right, like, I don't know, but I'm going to do it. Right, okay. When will you start? I don't know. <laughs> right, and then, are you mad? Yes! And then, have you talked to anyone as to why you're mad? Right, and have you ever been affirmed you should be angry. And now in your anger, where are the spaces that we have committed you to create? Right? So Connie one of Stella on the West Coast, she says, when a young person gets mad, three things you should do. One, affirm their anger. Right? They are not angry for fearing thing. Second thing, be angry with them. The third thing, Commit yourself to creating spaces where you both create. Because the big thing about school is that certain groups of young folks, they make the systems have made decisions that this group of young folks are not worthy of thinking and creating. So now, what does it mean to claim those spaces back? And I think in order to claim those spaces back for our own self-care, we have to start from love. Right? So what are we for in our justice work? What are we trying to do? And how do we do that collectively? And how will that first begin from a space? Right, so I think we have to, we have to, re thank you for that point, we have to reintroduce that into our work. And it's, it's something that I think long term will keep us alive. Right? It's very important for us. Thank you for that.
So that, that, and it, to me, over the last couple of days, it changes every week. But this week, that by a leader sign, hey, right? I mean, it's, it's the visceral nature of seeing that, right? And understanding that those young folks changed an election in real time. I and mean, it interrupted the common course of that election because Anita Alvarez was a machine politician who would have been elected again. Right? By abstention, right? So it would have been folks not voting when they got, got their elected. So these, these things around, when you think about it, but not to rest our hat on it, but just think about it as a moment as connected, right, to this larger historical continuum. Yes, sir? So you, you spoke to the, to like abolitionist framework, and I guess <coughs> what I'm interested in, uh, I imagine many of us, right? You spoke about how the neighborhood change led into the college, right? And Pretty sure that most of us are headed into the system, right? We're headed into the system that is part of the, the same mechanism that oppress our neighborhoods, right? And navigating that space be, between being in the system and looking to build those just alternatives that is part of that abolitionist framework. How do, what is the strategy? What, what approaches do you have to that? Right. I think this thing really comes with what I've been noticing over the last couple of days is, and this is part of the historical continuum. I think about one way I think about how my father learned how to read. So my dad was in a my dad was in a third grade classroom in Chicago that had 66 students. So he always cracks his joke. He was like, man, school of crowd is just about the same than six, seven years ago when I was in third grade. But there was a woman who was one of the teachers in his school that said, okay, we know that we got this overcrowded situation. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get some books. I'm going to open my house. And in my house, we're going to actually read. Right? We're gonna read. So I'm going to let everybody in the neighborhood look. You want to read. You want to come through. You know, make sure that if you got folks who are struggling, you got uh, sons and daughters that are struggling to read, just send them to the house. So my father would go to this house, and he would be reading the equivalent of a basal reader with a grown man right next to him who was also reading the same thing. And they called this place the Reading House. Right? But it was these, you know, you know, in colleges we can we can give it all slick names like the subaltern space or fugitive space, third space, you know, in the postmodern saying, right? <laughs> the, um, but I think Fred Moon gets this right in terms of thinking about fugitive space. Right? These are spaces that come on the volition of people making a decision on what the liberation condition is, right? So the reading house for my father was his liberation condition, right? Because we knew, he knew, he might have been struggling as a reader because there was 66 young folks in his class with one teacher, right? But that another teacher said, okay, here's how we can address this, right? So now thinking about what are those fugitive spaces? Because movements, and I think Moten is right about this, come from those fusion of spaces. People who have determined that their condition is intolerable. Right? See, we, we attribute that to Marx, right? Because there's a, uh, in the current report on urban arrest in 1969, the beginning of the report says, the United States has come to a Marxist moment where the people have, have found their conditions intolerable. But actually, that positioning predates Marx. Right? So now when we think about slave rebellions, right? We can take that to Nat Turner, right? In terms of I hope they do that, I hope they play that, I hope they do that right that movie, right? But this thing around the conditions being intolerable, and now here's what we're going to do to now determine that condition. So I think just like when we have good teachers that we know have dedicated themselves to that extra work, I always think about it. And think about it in your own experience. How many of y'all have a good teacher? That was always in trouble in the church. Right? They were in trouble because they made a decision that they were more concerned about education than they were school. Right? They were, they were in trouble for that. Right? But the thing is, they were in trouble for all the right reasons. And now, can we make an individual decision to build collective space with others that are centered around that victim condition? That may or may not happen in that schoolhouse, depending on particular levels of the rest that we may be experiencing. But I think those are the things that we have to start to do. So we have time for one more question. Well,
always do this. What, I, you all can do two questions, do you say your questions, and then I, I can get a vote. <laughs> uh, I was wondering what suggestions you have for someone who's entering a space of injustice where they feel like an outsider, or they, they themselves aren't experiencing this injustice. What mentality should you go in with to uh, address this appropriately? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.